So let me just introduce the, the first speaker. So Natalia Lopez Anguita, she's a PhD student in the, in the stem cell chromatin group at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics. And she's going to tell us about hypoxia. Yeah, thank you, Irene, uh, for the introduction. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully, there is no issue. Can you see yeah, the slides? Yeah. yeah. All right, so thank you again for the introduction, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And um, today I'm going to talk about hypoxia and especially its role in pluripotent stem cells, how it shapes cell identity and how it modulates aspects of gastrulation. Um, and bite of mental oxygen is crucial for mammalian life and low oxygen levels, namely hypoxia, occurs naturally in the developing embryo and cells can adapt to it. Um, during earlier stages of development, the early embryo is already exposed to a hypoxic environment with oxygen levels that goes from around 8% in the oviducts and gradually decreasing until around 2% levels in the uterus where the blastocyst is gonna implant. Thus, uh, self-fate decisions and aspect of development and differentiation occurs in a hypoxic environment in vivo. Nonetheless, the role of hypoxia as a factor influencing stem cell behavior and developmental and differentiation trajectories is not well understood. Um, so in our investigation, we focus on the late blastocyst, or let's say in, an, in other words, in the three cell types that are present in the late blastocyst, the epiblast, the trophoectoderm, and the primitive endoderm. And we aim to understand how hypoxia might impact uh, their identity. So to study them, we use ES cells, T cells, and SEM cells to model them in vitro. And the experimental design was to culture them in either normoxia, 20% uh, oxygen levels, or hypoxia, 2% oxygen levels, for two and seven days to monitor not only the acute or early hypoxia mediated response, but also the prolonged one. And for the aim of this presentation, I will focus on ES cells that are the cells that are able to, to give rise to any embryonic cell type in, a, in the adult organism. As the first observation, we saw that ES cells actually can adapt to hypoxia. And we say so because if you look in the bright field images, the ES cell colonies are quite similar to the counterpart in normoxia. And the only difference that we found is that they uh, proliferate significantly slower, but they maintain uh, their undifferentiated state. Additionally, we score for NANOC, a pluripotent marker, and we observe no significant difference in the um, uh, expression of it, which means that the, the pluripotent state of ESLs is not compromised. Um, to better understand this, we perform um, um, bulk RNA-seq to try to understand to, to a more, in a deeper way, the transcriptional programs and their hypox uh, hypoxic environment. And what, what we basically observe is that there is a moderate number of differentially expressed genes, and they are more towards activation. The differentially expressed genes seems to be uh, time dependent, and the majority of them are getting activated only after seven days of, cu of culturing the cells in hypoxia. When we look at the biological process that are associated with the differentially expressed genes, what we observe is an early response that is um, basically related to terms that are known to be um, happening in a hypoxic environment, such as angiogenesis, glycolysis activation, or um, activation of uh, pyruvate metabolic processes. What it was very interesting to see is that not only in the early response, but also in the prolonged one, we observed many biological processes associated with cell development and differentiation. 
And these were, uh, this was very uh, striking to us because we observed that the cells in culture were not um, differentiating. So next, what we did is to have a closer look to genes related to pluripotency and also to early differentiation by looking at marker genes of the three uh, germ layers, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And what we observe in here is that while pluripotency was not affected, we observe a selective induction of genes of the endoderm and the mesoderm lineages, such as TLF1, EOMS, uh, or TBX6. It is known that the induction of mesendoderm marker genes are activated by wind pathway, which was also upregulated in hypoxia ESL, hypoxic ESLs. And this is just an example of the gradual uh, induction of wind tree that is quite uh, uh, interesting because it's going in the same direction as the activation of T. But wind tree was not the only gene that was induced uh, uh, under hypoxic conditions. We observe a lot of genes that were also getting upregulated. So taking this data together, I have shown you uh, that hypoxia mediates a selective induction of wind pathway genes and their targets, such as wind 3 T or EOMIS. Or EOMIS. And this uh, probably have a role in determining an early transcriptional primitive strict signature in ESLs. So then to test the functionality of whether the hypoxia induced early primitive strict signature is able to enable the emergence of cell states and tissues that you re resemble and arise from the primitive streak, we employed an in vitro differentiation model. And, and we selected the, the gastroloid model because it's a very nice tool to recapitulate developmental uh, events of mouse gastrulation. In the conventional uh, gastroloid protocol, uh, just to sum up, uh, the idea is to, to start with a number of ESLs that are going to aggregate. And then it's very important to activate the wind pathway. And this is done by a pulse with uh, chiron for uh, 24 hours during the, uh, from the 48 hours to 72 hours of the process of gastro, uh, gastroloid formation. And under these conditions, aggregates undergo symmetry breaking, um, elongation, and self-organization in the of the body plan. They show as well a polarized T expression in the posterior end and simultaneously are mediated by wind and T activation, the three germ layers emerge. Given that hypoxia induces expression of wind pathway related genes and T in ES cells, we reasoned that uh, the hypoxia mediated induction of the um, transcriptional early primitive streak signature might be enough to enable the formation of gastroloids and therefore enable symmetry breaking and axial elongation in the absence of any exogenous wind activation. Um, so, Therefore, we perform um, gastroloids in the conventional way with chiron. And as you can see in hypoxia, we were able to form gastroloids in a very similar manner to the counterparts in normoxia. And it was very interesting to see that when we perform gastroloids in the absence of chiron, a, the wind activator, we were only able to form gastroloids under hypoxic, hypoxic conditions. And it was very interesting to see that we already observed polarized T expression in the posterior axis, um, quite localized already in an early time point at 72 hours. So it was a bit different to the uh, conventional protocol. And that afterwards we could see the elongation and still the polarized expression of T. Next, to better characterize the transcriptional changes that occur when implementing hypoxic environment during gastroloid formation, we perform single cell RNA seq in hypoxic gastroloid in the presence or the absence of chiron. 
Um, and then we annotated uh, the, the data using a mouse reference atlas of the gastrulating embryo. So here, coloring the annotated cells by germ layer origin reveals substantial differences between the different conditions. And the most in, um, revealing observations that we observe, if you go here to the uh, bottom panel, are that um, cat endoderm is highly enriched in both hypoxic plus and minus chiron gastroloids. Um, and it seems to be appearing in a wind independent manner because we saw it in the presence of or absence of chiron. Similarly, notochordial like cells emerge only in the hypoxic gastroloids, again, most likely in, the, in a wind independent manner. And this is extremely interesting because this cell population is completely absent in the conventional uh, gastroloid um, protocol. Additionally, if we focus in the hypoxic plus chiron uh, gastroloids, we see that hypoxia enhances lineage representation. Here we see a clear increase of mesodermal lineages, such as somite, pharyngeal arc mesoderm, and also intermediate cell states, such as the anterior and posterior primitive uh, presomitic mesoderm. And we think that the increase of the somitic um, uh, lineage could be due to the appearance of the bipotent neural mesodermal progenitors that are um, somehow directing the formation of the um, mesodermal, mesodermal lineages. And last, in the hypoxia minus chiron uh, gastroloids, we see nearly complete depletion of the mesodermal lineage. But in the other hand, we see a huge increase of um, neural cells. And these neural cells seem to be similar to the four midbrain counterparts in the in vivo scenario. To better characterize these neural cells, we collected, we analyzed all the cells that were annotated as for midbrain and future spinal core uh, in vivo. And what we did is a characterization of these neural cells which shows that actually the hypoxia minus chiron gastroloids present cells here in purple with a more cephalic identity. Yet these uh, brain-like cells might be immature due to the absence of brain-like of brain markers such as EN1 or OTX2. So taking together, um, this investigation revealed the impact of hypoxia on stem cell behavior, where it's able to shape stem cell identity, and also during gastrulation, where it modulates mo uh, morphogenesis and cellular composition in 3D gastrulation models. Hence, this investigation provides a direct uh, link between the microenvironmental factors and stem cell functions, and strongly support the use of physiological relevant oxygen levels in models of embryo development. With that, I would like to finish the presentation um, by highlighting my group. Um, and somehow, most of us were involved in this project, also some people that already left, and also mentioned very importantly that this was done in collaboration with GSL Lab in, in Dresden, Germany, and also with help with the Genome Regulation Group here in, in the Max Planck Institute in, in Berlin. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Many thanks, Natalia, for a very interesting presentation. Feel free to put um, your questions in the Q&A um, in the Q and A box. Um, in the meantime, while people are um, sort of uh, populating the, the box, and maybe I'll, I'll just start by asking a question. So, your um, I was just curious how how you feel your findings relate to um, to previous findings that pH controls wind signaling downstream of glycolysis in the context of, for example, axis elongation in the tail bar. Um, do you think <laughs> there might be some sort of so, so that might be kind of a contribution to your mechanism, or there could be two independent inputs, or how do you how do you see them? 
Yeah, this is this is uh, an interesting question. Um, yeah, I think um, here uh, I focus the presentation, but also the the whole um, investigation in in hypoxia. But it's important to to say that is uh, hypoxia activation always is always in many cases and in in in, in huge uh, in a huge context is um, coupled with metabolism. And specifically, it really controls the switch from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis. Um, we think, uh, if I remember well, we saw in the very beginning, and this was quite constant, when we are culturing ESLs, only ESLs in, in hypoxia, the very first observation that we saw is the change in the color of the media. Oh. So for sure, there is a change in the pH. Um, I We never went, um, too much into that, but I, I think it might be related to the gen, uh, to the formation of of pyruvate, um, and to some extent this is crucial um, for afterwards ESLs being able to generate gastroloids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There's a couple of questions. Let me just read them. Um, how do the effects you see of hypoxia of, of hypoxia on differentiation down the different lineages in your gastroloids fit with any knowledge of the levels of oxygen in the different germ layers in vivo? Mm. Yeah. Um, I think um, this is also uh, tricky. I think it's. I would say that I'm just trying to go back to the um, I'm not sure um, how much is it is known of how hypoxia might modulate different cell types in the during during gastrulation. Uh, so far, what I see is that it really um, has a specific Mm, enhancement of some meso of the mesodermal lineages and also um, even the the neural uh, cells mm. now to correlate this to the in vivo scenarios is is, is always a bit hard yeah, yeah sure and one last question before we move on for the so the embryonic stem cells, before you do the gastroloid experiment, mm -hmm. whether ES is cultured in normoxia or hypoxia? Thanks. Yeah, so we tried both. Um, and this, if you go to the to the article, you can see that. Uh, today I'm just I'm just showing part of it uh, for the aim of the timing. But we tried actually four combinations. We tried culturing ESLs in normoxia and doing gastroloid in hypoxia, the other way around, culturing in hypoxia and doing gastrulation in normoxia or doing the whole thing in hypoxia. And indeed we see some differences. We didn't do um, single cell for all of it um, yet or maybe in the future. Um, but what I can tell you is that in the absence of chiron, the best output was by doing the uh, pre-culturing of ESLs in normoxia and gastro gastroloid in hypoxia. In, in the other way around of doing everything in hypoxia was not efficient. Uh, very little um, structures were able to elongate. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We should probably move on. Thank you, Natalia, for a very interesting talk.